talking to book people about books and other stuff. Hello and welcome to episode three of Talking to Book People About Books and Other Stuff. I am about to attempt to connect up to Benjamin Myers, whose book, The Offing, uh, I had read during lockdown to the annoyance of my colleague, Tom, who's been telling me to read this book. And he's not the only one of them in my Mr. B's colleagues who's been saying this. He's been telling me to read this book for months, um, but I managed to get around to it. And it is undoubtedly the perfect tonic for these days that we're living in. Benjamin's other books include Gallows Pole, Beastings and Pig Iron, often a lot darker in tone, um, but equally brilliant. And again, um, my colleagues are big fans of a number of them. We hand sell them an awful lot. So it is exciting to be able to uh, dial right now over to him somewhere in Yorkshire. And uh, let's see if let's see if he's ready for us. Thank you very much for uh, agreeing to have a chat. You look like you're in your own home, at least. You managed to be in your own home for this whole thing. And how's, yeah. how, how's it changing life? I feel like I've been waiting for this moment all my life. Um, <laughs> I feel like a lockdown and isolation is the one thing I have training and experience in, actually. <laughs> okay. As a writer, my day involves getting up, shuffling about, walking the dog, writing all day, thinking about food, what I'm going to have for lunch, what I'm going to have for tea, doing some exercise, working out what I'm going to um, watch to unwind. Right. Um, so, yeah, aside from the sort of general horror and tragedy of everything that's happening out there, yeah. I'm thriving and <laughs> I've never felt uh, more relaxed. Really? But the strange thing is I, um, I was away uh, for almost all of February in self-isolation in staying in a cottage in Scotland belonging right. to a friend of mine. Was that for uh, Yeah, right. Yeah, yeah. It's a cottage that belongs to the Gordon Byrne Trust. It's a um, residency for writers, really. But whenever the place is empty, I, I'm, I, I get a call saying I can use it. And it's in the Scottish borders, and it's about seven miles from the nearest shop or pub. It's right in the moors. Uh, it's in a tiny village, which has nothing in it, really. Um, and I go there often and I just go into lockdown and I take, take my laptop and a pile of books and some food and, and, and my dog and um, write, basically. Yeah. So I was up there for, for a month and then just as the virus was kicking in um, and then I got a call saying I had to leave a day or two earlier. Um, so I had planned to... F- finished writing a book there and then I was going to come home and spend March being a bit more sociable and go to some art galleries and museums and see some bands and um uh, but I went from four weeks of isolation into sort of government government uh, uh, enforced isolation yeah um so it's fine that's fine I'm um I'm I've, I've finished a new book while in lockdown my plan was I was going to stay in Scotland until the book was finished there was no deadline for the book um i was just something i've decided to write and i've written it quite quickly um and uh, i'd like to say the pandemic has given it a sense of urgency but it it wasn't really it's just something i wanted to write in one go okay and i worked on it every day until it was finished and i came home and i and i and i had to write the final few pages back at home the offing came out in paperback in uh March the 5th it was yeah and it's the first book of mine that's been really picked up in advance by bookshops and the trade and and all of that stuff it came out in hardback in August and and got lots of good reviews and coverage that I was happy with yeah. um but this time around it was going to be on it was book of the month in lots of big stores in London Waterstones and Foils so there's lots of big displays which no one will get to see. No. And I, I haven't even seen them because I was in Scotland when it came out. And um, so I know that there's all these empty bookshops across the country and across London with the lights off and the doors locked with my book prominently displayed as you walk yeah. in. Yeah. Which I quite like that image. It's a, it's a kind of weird, haunted feeling. Yeah, it's, nice, it's nice as a short-term thing, as long as they can eventually make their way into the hands of readers. Right? Inadvertently... 
you know, I think you've written you've written a book in the offing that is is potentially the perfect tonic and the perfect read for once we hit the the recovery phase. It's in the aftermath of World War Two is the setting, and it's about it's about recovery and hope and getting back on your feet, right? I, I started writing the offing in uh, twenty fifteen. Okay. Off the back of writing several grim, yeah, much darker. sort of quite visceral, yeah violent dramatic semi-gothic novels yeah. uh the one which people probably know is the the gallows ball is the one yeah. that's kind of got the most traction um but i wrote the offing as an antidote to that and at the time i was feeling very anxious and exhausted and, and, a, and, a, and a bit depressed but it's kind of not sort of depressed enough that i didn't want to write and at the same time um without getting too much into the politics of the time, because everyone knows the backdrop, the, the EU referendum happened. Britain felt, uh, and still does to some extent, felt really ugly and divided. So I decided I'm going to write something that's hopeful and sunny, and it's yeah. a place that's, um, that I want to visit every day, as if I'm going on holiday. Yeah. Because of a, a lot of it was written during the winter in Yorkshire, yeah. um, a lot of my memories of writing are sitting in a or of sitting in a library in Halifax while snow came down outside. Yeah. But the book is set over the course of one summer following sec the Second World War, and it's about a sort of quite unlikely friendship between a young man, a sixteen-year-old boy called Robert, who's from the coal fields of Durham, who has just finished school and he's seeing the world for the first time, and he happens upon. Uh, the, a cottage belonging to an older woman called Dulcy, who is quite mysterious and she's quite confident and bohemian and rebellious. It's kind of almost a mood piece in that it's a celebration of the landscape and friendship and summer and the pair bond over poetry and food and uh, the discovery of a manuscript of poetry that Robert finds, which yeah. is called The Offing, hence the title of the novel. There's a very specific framework to the book, which is sort of late spring to the end of summer, so May to, May to September, really, and it's about um, the sort of life-changing experience that Robert has over the course of one summer. The Offing is the shortest novel I've ever published, but it's the one that I've rewritten the most times oh really the first yeah the, the first 20 or 30 pages i probably wrote 10 or 15 times really uh, and for the first probably year of writing the book it was just the opening section and i just kept going back to page one and taking a pen and going through it i, I knew that the opening pages were crucial but i didn't have a story really i, I knew there was a young man heading to a, a cottage in a meadow and someone was waiting for him there yeah. or not even waiting for him someone was there and they would meet so we'd have two two yeah. people would collide and then the novel would really begin there there is a moment at the beginning of a book where um well not at the beginning of the book at the beginning of robert's encounter with dulcie where where they share a lobster dinner a lobster fresh bread somehow she has this incredible larder you know despite the mm -hmm. rationing continuing uh and and butter i mean it's so hedonistic that scene i, I and i just i just wondered if how that how the aspect of it came about i think well part of the reason food features so prominently is because it's set just after the second world war uh, but I did a lot of research into rationing and the war ended in 1945, obviously, but rationing went on for several years. Yeah. <clears throat> and the consensus is the Second World War ended. Britain was victorious. Hurrah, you know, yeah. long live Winston Churchill and the Queen. But actually, the Brit Britain was damaged and the, the male population was depleted because there's lots of people killed, yeah. loads of men injured. Uh, women as well, but predominantly men and a lot of people who were damaged. Um, so... The food shortage carried on for years, <clears throat> but as you pointed out, Dulcie has access to all, she has a full larder, which people will have done because people of privilege and power would have connections yeah. and black market connections really, you know, yeah. and it, I, it's the same thing today. Um, so I wanted to 
I wanted Dulcie to be able to educate Robert somehow and not yeah. in a patronizing way. And I thought food was a good route into yeah. that because coming from a pit village, uh, and if Robert was 16, he was born in 1930-ish, yeah. Yeah. which means most of his life was lived in wartime, yeah. which means that he missed out on a lot of basics. Uh, a, a, a good example is lemon. You know, there was a shortage of lemons. Yeah. You and I take them for granted, and we love tasted them from a young age. Yeah. He, he'd never tasted a lemon. Yeah. So even the lemon on the lobster is a, a new sort of taste sensation. It's a real powerful flavor. But I also wanted to um, look at things like the fact that they're eating lobster. Lobster is symbolically very decadent in the same way that champagne is or oysters. But actually, lobster is an indigenous food to Britain. And yeah. my uh, my wife's mother just a few years ago was buying lobsters fresh off the boat. She lived uh, on the coast, on the east coast, um, out at Withensea near Hull. And she knew the fishermen. And, you know, if you give them a fiver, they'd give you a big lobster. Right. Um, so that I guess maybe I chose lobster rather than, say, cod or haddock or something is because lobster belongs to the wealthy and it belongs to London restaurants in our, in our, yeah, in our minds. Yeah. Yeah. They drink good wine. Yeah. They eat fresh food. Yeah. And through these meals, Robert realizes there's a whole world beyond, even yeah. if that world is only Robin Hood's Bay, a hundred yeah. miles from where he's from or 80 miles. Yeah. It's the first step on a journey that takes him out into a wider world. And yeah. And food is the key that unlocks that, opens that door for him really. yeah uh, you know, i told my colleague tom i have a colleague called tom who is a champion of all of your books in our bookshop normally if, if it weren't for this situation he would be on the shop floor now waving one or other or many of your different books right. customers faces um and uh so i told him i was going to be able to have a chat with you and he was he was extremely bitter uh but uh his the one question he wanted me to ask or really dig into which was sort of already on the agenda anyway but he was particularly keen in your case is to find out whether what you've been reading and and whether your reading has changed because of you know what's going on and the fact that we're in this this isolation. <clears throat> my reading has slowed down a lot recently um but i don't think it's to do with the pandemic and lockdown as such it's more to do with the fact that I've um, I've got a book out next year, which is a collection of short stories. So I've spent um, the past few weeks line editing that, which is the very final edit before yeah. it gets typeset. Right. And when it, when you're focusing so intently on that, it's hard to read anything else. Yeah. But that that was done straight after finishing the novel that I was writing in Scotland. So I've basically finished two books. I have got some book books here oh, yeah. because I have still been reading um, I've just read this of Love and Hunger by Julian McLaren Ross okay. who I'd not read before it's set in the late 1930s on a coast this feels like a book that Dulcie from The Offing would definitely have read maybe that's why I read it because <laughs> The Offing I wrote as escapism and this is escapism into a dreary pre-war England what else I've been reading Millstone Grit by Glyn Hughes. Okay. My dog's just come to visit. I'll put him on camera. Yeah, definitely put him on camera. Hey. That's Cliff. Yeah, he's doing exactly the standard pet reaction to cameras. That's a slight, yeah. slightly bemused. Is someone yeah. actually there? But yeah, Millstone Grit. Uh, Glyn Hughes was a novelist and nonfiction writer and poet. And this is a nonfiction work, which is a journey through pretty much through Calderdale, where I live. Yeah. Um, and it came out in the 70s. It's going to be reissued by Little Toller. Oh, yeah, great. Little Toller publisher, yeah. yeah. I've been working with them a little bit recently. Um, and they reissue Lost Nature Classics or yeah. Landscape Classics. So I said to them, you should put this out, secretly hoping they'd ask me to write a forward. And about an hour later, they replied saying, yeah, we'll put it out. Do you want to write the forward? Great. Um, so they secured the rights to that. So I'm just yeah. writing the forward to that. Amazing. I've nearly finished. Maurice. A.M. Forster. Um, yeah. I watched the film last year. <laughs> I saw this and it's, um, it's a hardback first edition, but it was written in the 1920s. 
But E.M. Forster wrote it um, knowing it would never come out in his lifetime. Yeah. Because it's, all, it's about a homosexual relationship at a time when it was highly illegal. And he just felt like he couldn't put it out. It would destroy him and his reputation and maybe relationships that he had. But it's, it's a really beautiful book. I've got another book, A Tyler's Afternoon. Oh, yeah. by Lars Gustafsson. I think because the offing is quite stripped down and yeah. quite a quick read, yeah. I've got into the idea of reading novellas. And A Tyler's Afternoon is about a Tyler and it's his afternoon. <laughs> <laughs> so, like, I mean, yeah. that's, the, that's, that's think... the elevator pitch. It's, <laughs> it's about... Uh, well, I don't know, I haven't read it yet, but um, I don't know, I thought I'll read about a Tyler. Yeah, <laughs> I actually think that um, all the best writers are coming out of Ireland at the moment. Right. Okay. So who else? Uh, Rob Doyle is yeah. a brilliant writer um, from Dublin, who is on Bloomsbury, which is how I discovered him. Actually, they, they gave me some um, a pile of free books, yeah. and he's just had a book out this year called Threshold. Yeah, which is. Okay. On the surface, it reads like a series of travel essays about a guy called Rob. Yeah. But um, there's a lot of drugs and a lot of travel, and it blurs the kind of boundaries between fact and fiction and novel and memoir. Um, and, and I loved it so much that I've just read his short story collection and his novel called We Are the Young Men. Yeah. Which has just come out as a film. Yeah. He's Great. a fantastic writer. Um, Wendy Erskine, Colin Barrett wrote a book yes. called Young Skins a few years yeah. ago, yeah, uh, which I loved. And one of the stories has just come out as a film. Well, Sebastian Barry, I'm a fan of. Um, yeah. you know, he's, he's, a, he's a big name. He's another writer who's had this situation, you know, where his new book has come out right in the middle of this. So it's just, yeah, I mean, obviously... Sebastian Barry is a very established writer, so maybe it's not affected him as some as as, as many sort of debut writers or whatever. Where there's this a sudden lack of you know impetus behind the books because of the closed shops. I mean, you probably know more about it than I do, but I, I guess it'll, we won't know the, the 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 full impact until this has kind of passed. Because, as I said before, I've been trying to judge how the offing is doing, and obviously there's no sales no. over the counter, but a lot of great indie shops such as I mean you sell online don't you yeah yeah we're you, selling it online yeah. we've got it we we had it on recommended lists and what have you I mean the only thing is <clears> that <throat> supply chain is so fractured and the thing that's most fractured at the moment is the newer books getting them getting the newer books filtering through once the limited stock that was at the beginning is gone so, I think the the like, um the small indie publishers are having a much tougher time because it's, their, their sort of existence is more tenuous and they don't have yeah. huge resources to fall back on. I've been working with um, uh, Little Toller and Blue Moose books uh, to raise some funds for them. So I put out a short, I might as well plug it while I'm here, yeah, yeah. I put out a short story last week okay. called A Stone Statue in the Future, which is a new short story I've written. It's, it's downloadable as an e-story, um, which is not something I generally do because I like to see stuff in print. Yeah. But to, to act quickly, yeah. we've, and so we've where's come that? together. Uh, buy it on Little Toller's website. It's okay. three pound. Um, yeah. We sold 500 copies in the first day. Great. Um, and that was only a week ago and it's still selling. And yeah. the money is to is to go to Little Toller and Blue Moose because um, yeah. they've got titles coming out, but um, they've been hit. And I'm just trying to do what I can to help. It's also to drive traffic through their websites. Cause so yeah. people have been visiting Little Toller for the first time or Blue Moose and, yeah. and seeing what other books are, and buying physical books as well as yeah. downloading the story. No, it's great. I mean, we've done a, we've been doing a sort of indie publisher of the day. Today, I know we featured Little Toller. I must make sure we've got Blue Moose on the schedule as well because we've just sort of been, yeah. because because those, you know, once we figured out how to actually function ourselves as an independent business, <clears> look after <throat> everyone's jobs and actually sort of do it, you know, without the shop floor. Yeah, then you start thinking, okay, right, well, who's really else in the in the ecosystem is is in peril and yeah all authors i think especially if it's their first book coming out i feel very 
very much for them that they're missing out on you know the chance to go talk about it and everything and then as you say yeah. indie, indie publishers often with smaller warehouses that maybe have closed completely for a while you know and having to repurpose and yeah and they're so reliant on on bookstores actually recommending and things getting a little bit of a buzz from being on a table or whatever so it's yeah yeah and people such as yourself hand sell i mean i spend half my life in independent bookshops but i'm really grateful to the for the support that shops such as yours and loads of others. I mean, it's too many to name. If we're allowed free movement over the summer, I'll try and come in. Yeah, love it. Because I'd like, I'd like, still like to just get in the car and go for a bit of a road trip. And that's a good excuse to visit some bookseller yeah. friends who I've not met in person and yeah. thank them. Well, we'd love to. We'd love to see you. Listen, thanks a lot, Ben. And um, yeah, well, we'll keep on recommending the offing. I say, I reckon it's going to be. Um, I do reckon it's going to be one of the go-to books once, especially once we see an exit. I think it's that. It's that reconnecting with, especially with the outdoors as well. It's, and again, especially if this weather stays, it'll be the perfect. Yeah. All right. Great. Thank you very much. Well, thanks for your. Thanks for your support. No problem and at all. Say hi to your colleagues for me. I will. I really will. All thanks right. a lot. Cheers, Ben. Nice thanks a lot. Cheers. Bye. Please note, no book people were harmed in the making of this film, though some were technologically challenged. All books are available from www.mrbeesemporium.com. Keep safe and keep reading.